Okay, in this video I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on quantum statistics. We're on video number 30 and this video I'm going to get the Bose-Einstein distribution for bosons which is we're going to maximize the occupancy function or we're going to get the most probable distribution. It's all three different ways of saying the same thing. Uh, I'd also like to note that I have a, video, uh, or a website now, universityphysicstutorials.com. So the previous videos to this are numbers 29 where I got the formulas for alpha and beta 28, which is the most detailed of my videos on this, I fully derived the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution function. I spoke about maximizing the multiplicity, and I also did a small bit on Lagrange multipliers. So, if you're stuck on anything in this particular video, you should watch number 28, where I did everything uh, quite step by step. So, let's go ahead and begin. So. A quick recap of what we're going to do. In a previous video, we got a function for the multiplicity for uh, fermions, we'll say. All right. Now, in order to find out the most probable distribution, we're trying to maximize, trying to maximize the multiplicity. The most probable distribution is the one with the highest multiplicity. Now, it turns out that maximizing the multiplicity function itself is difficult because it's a difficult function. Its functional form is difficult. So instead what we do is we actually nat we maximize the logarithm of the function which allows us to, um, to manipulate it allows us to manipulate the multiplicity into an easier function. Now we're maximizing it subject to two constraints and the constraints are as follows that the number of particles does not change. Okay, so the, tor the change of the total number of particles is the sum of the changes of the, the number of particles in each macro box, which is delta n sub s. Okay, and that's it. That's that's the uh, that's now that of course is the uh, that is one constraint. That's the first constraint, or delta n. And then there's another constraint on the energy that delta e is equal to the sum over s epsilon the energy of each each particle delta n sub s like that. There are two constraints. So in order to maximize or minimize something subject to constraints, we use Lagrange multipliers. And the whole point here is that when something is maximized or maximized or minimized, the gradients are, e are proportional and they are e equal um, with this proportionality constant. So what we do is we get the gradient of a function, and we know that the gradient of a function is proportional to the gradient of our constraint, we'll say call it, that's the first constraint, and it's equal by this proportionality constant alpha, if it's at it, and if we have two, then it's equal by this proportionality constant beta and the gradient of the second one, the second constraint. So that's exactly what we're going to do, and that will give us our occupancy function. All right, so just to remind us, in a previous video, we worked out that the probability for bosons as a function of the number of particles in each macrostate was the multi multiple excuse me over s n sub s plus g sub s minus 1 factorial divided by n sub s factorial and g sub s minus 1 factorial remember n sub s is the number of particles in macro box s g sub s is the number of microstates in macro in macro, macro box s we know that Stirling's approximation says the natural logarithm of a factorial is equal to uh, a log a minus a. We know that log a b is equal to log a plus log b. And we know that log a over b is equal to log a minus log b. So, I, like I said, I want to take the logarithm of this because it's easier to manipulate. So when you take the logarithm, we see the whole thing itself is a quotient, so we use this formula. We see that the denominator then has its has a product, okay, so we apply this particular formula, and then in each of the three um, factorials we apply Stirling's approximation. Okay, and it is a bit of a pain in the face, but you know if you do it nice and slowly, you will get the following answer. So we're going to get the the, uh, the logarithm of p for the fermions is equal to the sum over s of the following. 
we're going to have n sub s plus g sub s minus 1 log n sub s plus g sub s minus 1 minus n sub s plus g sub s minus 1 then we're going to have another term, like there are lots of terms here minus n sub s log n sub s plus n sub s minus g sub s minus 1 log g sub s minus 1 plus g sub s minus 1 and then we can just close that off then with my green marker like that okay and if you look at this carefully enough you'll see that there are some factors to be cancelled okay so you have this uh, where is it gone? This ends the best here, these, and uh, this guy here. Go. Alright? Now, next, um, we're going to have the following that the log of P is going to be equal to the sum over S, and we're going to have N sub S plus g sub s minus 1 the log of n sub s plus g sub s minus 1 minus n sub s log g sub s oh, n sub s log n sub s, excuse me and we're also going to have another term minus g sub s minus 1 log of g sub s minus 1 ok, that is log p now, remember our constraint functions. Okay, we need to remember our constraint functions. So the, the constraint functions are as follows. We said that the sum over s of delta n sub s is equal to delta n or dn is equal to zero. So number number of particles that we have change it does not change. And next the sum over s of epsilon delta n sub s um, is equal to delta epsilon is equal to zero. So the number, the amount of energy does not change. Okay. Now remember, we have this function being trying. To, we're trying to maximize this function subject to these two constraints. So in order to do that, what we're going to need is follows. We're going to need that the we're going to need the gradient of log p is equal to alpha times the gradient of um, of this one plus beta times the log, sorry, beta times the gradient of the sum of epsilon delta n sub s. Uh, I think that it, that it might look difficult, but it should make pretty straightforward, a pretty good sense, because these are the two multipliers, alpha and beta, the multipliers trying to, trying to enforce the constraint. So that means we need to get the derivatives with respect to n sub s, so it's del del n sub s because that's the that's what or that's what everything is a function of. So let's go ahead and get that. Well if we get del del n sub s of this, what you know what do we get? Okay, so it's well that should be pretty straightforward. Um, that should be pretty straightforward. We're just going to get del del n sub s okay or the sum of one we'll say and here, del, del n sub s, the sum over s, epsilon delta n sub s is equal to sum over s, epsilon, like that. So you can see when we multiply by alpha, this is just going to become the sum over alpha, and this is become the sum over epsilon times beta. So we have beta out here, and we have alpha out here. Okay, so these, these, these are Lagrange multipliers, the sum over s of alpha, the sum over s of epsilon times beta. Now how do we get the derivative of this, this pretty mean looking thing here? Well, if we look at it, we realize it's not as mean as we think. And the reason is this, because anything, this is not, is not, it's not a function of n sub s. Okay, that's not a function of n sub s. And because it's not a function of n sub s, we may, we, we may as well ignore it. Okay? And for that reason, it's going to put approximately like that. So we're trying to get the derivative of this with respect to delta n sub s. Okay? So, 
how do we go how do we go ahead and get the derivative of this with respect to delta m sub s? Well let's go ahead and do it. We'll do it with my green bar. So del del n sub s, the log of p is equal to the following. I'm doing it in red actually. We're going to get the sum over s of the following. We're going to get the log of n sub s plus g sub s minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 minus the log of n sub s. Okay? Of course there are some product rules like this is a product rule here for example. Okay? So clearly these two here cancel. And if you look here, n sub s and g sub s are massive in comparison with the 1, so we can get rid of the 1. So what we're left is delta del del n sub s of the log of p is equal to the sum over s of the log of n sub s plus g sub s minus log of n sub s. And now we're ready to put all our pieces together. So the piece that I'm going to put together is the gradient of the log of p is equal to alpha times the gradient of the first constraint, like that, plus beta, the gradient, uh, epsilon delta n sub s, like that. Okay, we've gotten all the components of it. And if you put them together, we're going to get the following. We're going to get that the sum over s, we're going to get the log of n sub s plus g sub s, we're going to get minus the log of n sub s, is equal to the sum over s of alpha plus the sum over s of beta epsilon. Okay, so we can rewrite that. We know, because everything is the sum over s, the only way this can be satisfied is if the natural logarithm of n sub s plus g sub s minus n sub s, or minus the log, excuse me, of n sub s is equal to alpha plus beta epsilon. Alright, so we see on the left hand side of this equation we have a log a minus log b, so that's the same as log a over b, and then I'm going to do that and I'm going to exponentiate the whole lot. So we're going to get n sub s plus g sub s divided by n sub s is equal to e to the alpha plus beta epsilon. Okay? And if we rearrange, if we so rearrange for n sub s and divide across by n sub s, we're going to get the following. That n sub s is equal to the following. It's going to be equal to g sub s over e to the alpha plus beta epsilon minus 1. Okay, now I'm going to discuss in a moment that that's it, of course, that's it. So what does this, what does this particular thing mean? So bear with me and I'll just clean up my, my board. What we have so far is that n sub s is equal to g sub s over e to the alpha plus beta epsilon and we have this factor of minus 1. Now this, what is n sub s? N sub s is the number of particles in macro state S. Okay? So we're going to call this the number density. Why is this? Because in order to get the total number of particles up until now, what we did is we, we summed and we, we summed the n sub s's. We summed the n sub s's like this. So essentially we can think of this as a number density. If we're instead of going for a sum, if we can if so, some, for some reason we can say that this is an integral then what we're actually going to do, or if, excuse me, I'll say, I'll say that again. If for some reason we can make the jump by saying that it's no longer, we can treat it not as a discrete set of states, but as a continuous set of states, we can go from the sum to the integral. So that's what we do for lots of reasons. So we call it the number density. Then on the, on the top we have this g sub s. This once again is a discrete number. They're, they're integers and they're taught, they're, they describe the number of states in each macro box. But we go from the jump, we jump from g sub s, which is for discrete states, where we sum them, and we assume we can talk about a continuum of states where we talk about integrals. So this, this, this then becomes the, the density, the density of states.
And finally, 1 over e to the alpha plus beta epsilon minus 1, we call the occupancy function, or the probability that this would be uh, occupied. So this, that is the Fermi-Dirac occupancy function. So now, another way to write this is as follows. N is equal to G times F, where F is equal to 1 over e to the alpha plus beta epsilon minus 1. Now, because we're talking about, we're now made the jump from discrete states to continuous states, we need to talk about a placeholder. So they're usually functions of energy, and we get this. So the, the number density is equal to the density of states multiplied by the probability of occupancy. It does make sense. Look at my video on the number density, uh, density of states, number density and occupancy as well. So in order to get the total, we integrate n of e dE. That gives us uh, n. So that's going to be g of e times f of e dE. And if you want to get the energy, Okay, and that's pretty straightforward. So that's all I've got to say about that. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel, and you might also visit universityphysicstutorials.com. Thank you.